Our first guest today is Mark Burgess, CTO of CF Engine. Mark, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. So, the first question I have for you, what are the major issues infrastructure designers are currently facing these days? I know that's a big question. It's a great question because uh, it's changing all the time, of course, but I would say that today the, the things we, um, we come across the most are scale, complexity, and actually knowledge management, which is the one that everybody forgets. Um, but complexity in particular is coming back. You know, it used to be, it used to be the, the idea that uh, companies could standardize everything, uh, make everything the same, and, and make management very cheap by uh, making everything the same. But at some point, companies become more complex than that. They have many lines of business. They have different departments, different cultural, um, different cultures from different countries, and and there's a need to respond to this kind of cultural diversity. Um, so, and that brings complexity, of course, because people need tailored environments, very carefully tailored to their individual requirements. Sure. And supporting that kind of diversity, that kind of um, uh, complexity, actually, in principle, could get in the way of scaling. But, but if you're if you're savvy about it, and if you use these sort of new modern model-oriented approaches, it's really not more work than it needs to be. The other thing is uh, knowledge management, because once you've created this monster, of course, actually comprehending it as it scales up uh, is a huge challenge. And um, you look at companies like Google and Facebook that have these massive infrastructures, and sure. without some form of knowledge management, you'd be completely lost. You'd just sort of, right. you know, <laughs> your face would drop and you would just sure. be in awe of this. Uh, yeah, I would say scale, complexity, and, and knowledge, in fact. So does cloud infrastructure introduce new issues or does it just make old issues a bit more complicated? The cloud, yeah. I have my own ideas about the cloud. You know, for me actually the cloud is, is uh, all of the electronic devices that we use, the smartphones and the, the laptops and the, that's the real cloud and then of course it has, it requires this, uh, this magical infrastructure to make all of that work which is somehow hidden in the walls. Um, I think what the cloud infrastructure brings is this idea of uh, reusability, recyclability. And so it adds another dimension to the problem, but the, the issues are basically the same. The ability to quickly make changes, to, be, to uh, have a good model, a state that you want to get into, and, and so you can be compliant with a planned, architected uh, kind of design. You're not just sort of flying by the seat of your pants and hoping for the best, but but actually being able to get some kind of measure of predictability mm -hmm. on the system. I think ultimately predictability is as good as it gets. Sure. Some people want to, yeah, in the 90s it was very common for people to talk about locking down systems. We had this flirtation with security technologies mm -hmm. and, and they wanted to lock down systems so they couldn't change. But you, know, you try working in a straitjacket, it's not that easy. Sure. You need that flexibility, the plasticity of uh, being able to adapt infrastructure and on the fly as well to meet new new business needs as well. I think that's what we're seeing today. Um, greater understanding of businesses' requirements to, to go after new challenges, to keep up with competitors. And so the cloud somehow brings a new level of dy dynamism to this, which I think is refreshing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't actually add new, new challenges per se. Sure. When we're talking about large businesses, not just you know, smaller ones, do does the public cloud make sense for them, or, or is a private cloud the way to go? I think that also depends very much on the organization, sure. like what they decide to do. And again, coming back to this idea of you know, the security in the 90s, yeah. um, we had this sudden loss of trust in the infrastructure. And trust is, some, is a pendulum that swings back and forth you know, between, yes, we're happy to trust systems, and no, we're not going to trust anything. You know, the Russians have this proverb, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. uh, but verifying is expensive, actually. So if you, if, you don't, if you can't trust your infrastructure, then you have to actually verify. And that is an expensive uh, investment in you know, scanning technology. Or remember these packet managers that used to inspect every single packet mm -hmm. header and sort of out of control at some point. But I think um, the ability to trust in either an external provider, public cloud provider, or even your own private thing is very much a decision that you make. Mm -hmm. You could argue, for example, that public cloud providers have way more domain expertise and experience and can therefore secure your, uh, 
your machines, look after your machines much better mm -hmm. than you could do in-house. That's probably true for a, a certain proportion of uh, the industry. On the other hand, you may say, I would rather stuff my money in my mattress uh, <laughs> because I don't trust the banks. You know, sure. I, I can do a better job of doing that. Right. And certain companies have the in-house expertise to do that, in which case it probably makes commercial se financial sense to make their own. It would be cheaper for them to do sure. that. So how do you apply theoretical analysis to infrastructure? Uh, I picked up on that from this is my uh, yes. yeah yeah how do you, how do you, how do you I do got that? myself into this didn't I right yes. <laughs> yes. yeah I, I wrote uh, so I, I am my background is in theoretical physics actually um, and I was always the kind of theoretician that needed to have my hands in the pie just to, to understand that, just to make sure that the theory I was uh, creating was actually relevant to something of course um, I think all theory has to start with observation learning you set you, you you dive into a problem and you try to understand it if you can't understand the problem you can't create a theory about it mm -hmm. so this somehow this idea we've almost been programmed you know to to distrust theory and people who you know, have bad experience with math in school or something and they tend to think that theory is a bad thing but i think it was einstein who said that there's nothing more practical than a good theory it's just a way of putting a model a framework around your understanding and actually approximating coming up with a um, a suitably idealized approximation that it's actually manageable because mm. if you tried to have the perfect model of everything you just wouldn't be able to cope with all the details so it's about approximating it and getting roughly into shape and and having something you can deal with so when I approach uh, analytics I first of all start by by watching and learning and you observe the animals in their natural habitat and you start making some notes and look for patterns to see what kind of things happen what are the phenomena the natural phenomena that occur and then you try to come up with a model you know try to explain it somehow mm -hmm. and ultimately hopefully be able to predict this and use it for uh, to bend the technology to your will sure <laughs> do you anticipate a time when um, infrastructure management is completely automated uh, that's an interesting question as well you're good at these questions yeah. um, well, perhaps not completely automated. I suppose it depends what we mean by automated. Maybe not completely automated, but, but certainly um, programmable. You know, today we have this almost uh, ridiculous situation where you have servers and you have network devices. Mm -hmm. They need each other badly, and yet they're managed by two completely independent sets of people using two completely independent sets of principles and they've never come together for, for historical reasons, basically. But um, these things belong together, and, I, and the cloud is actually getting us to this stage where, <clears throat> pardon me, in a couple of years' time, probably 10 years' time, it's always slower than we expect, in 10 years' time maybe, we'll, we'll just be looking at some single API for this whole thing. Give me a resource. Sure. And what happens underneath that will be largely invisible to us, but sure. there will still be some sort of programmatic interface where we express our intentions because what humans bring to the table of course is the intent what is it we what is the purpose of this thing uh -huh. uh, what is it for and, and machines of course can't give us that also uh, ultimately there is the knowledge management aspect of it which um, which cannot be escaped easily people humans are really good at learning and machines are not so good at learning they can learn statistics and you know get some trends and what have you but uh, ultimately, humans need to make decisions and jump in at some point. So um, humans are going to be around for a long time, but I think their <laughs> role is going to be more and more towards uh, architectural planning, creativity. Sure. We'll be back to, which is a nice thought, isn't it? Because somebody argued, uh, I think it was Alvin Toffler argued years ago, that people always react to automation. That they think it's dehumanizing. Bringing robots into the workplace is dehumanizing. Yeah. But he argued that well, that's wrong. You know, what is dehumanizing is making human beings act like robots in the first place. Sure. So by bringing in the automation, you're actually rehumanizing the workplace, restoring that uh, role of the human being in a in a more honorable role. Right. So last question I have for you is kind of an odd question, but with so many different devices in the home now, is there going to be a time where you foresee me for something like CF Engine on a consumer grade level, something where people are managing smart devices, set-top devices, you know, all these different things. Do you foresee that happening? 
Absolutely. In fact, you know, uh, one of our users has a running has a CF agent running on his mobile phone, his Nokia mobile phone, yeah. very small small device, low power, uh, and it runs just fine. Actually, it doesn't need to be cut down very much. What the, the main issue, of course, is battery life. Yeah. So if you're running uh, a self healing management process, it's a it's pure overhead, of course. So and it's running down your batteries. But probably there are ways that you could strip down that and of course nobody's really looked very carefully at what kind of management needs to be done on these largely embedded devices yet. But CF Engine does run on pretty much every kind of hardware that we've been able to see. I think it will be about developing the appropriate interface to, to say what kind of promises do we want this device to keep? Mm. Uh, how do we want it to be configured? Well, how, what's its purpose? And how do we want it to be used? And then really boiling it down to the quintessential bits that uh, we want sure. to get out of this. So CF Engine will, works from the, the lowest, uh, the smallest to the largest installation, hundreds of tens of thousands of machines and the biggest yeah. sites. And um, does it because it's it really puts the individual machine in in this position of responsibility for its own state, much like an immune system. You know, you you are your body is responsible for its health. Although, of course, we still need doctors when it comes down to it. So, sure. again, the human role is still going to be necessary. And even with these embedded devices, embedded management, health healing, we're still going to need some kind of control panel. Right. But I envisage it's going to be much more like, you know, the air conditioner, the thermostat. Really? Uh, yeah, just a simple dial. Sure. Something, something very, very simple. Right. Um, and when you look at the advances in user interface design with the, with Apple and uh, and Android and um, and the new BlackBerry, you see uh, a completely new a completely new understanding of what it means to to interact with systems in a simple way. I think that that consumer that, that marriage between IT and consumerism is is taking us in interesting, exciting new directions, and I think CF Engine can be right in there, making it happen. I know I said last question before, but I lied. So that's that's <laughs> interesting. So. The, uh, the notion of a, a thermostat, simple, simple controls, how far off do you think we are from something like that? Maybe closer than you think. Yeah. Because it's really about system regulation. Once you have a model, you know, and this is, what, you know, this is what a lot of my research went into doing, to be able to define the notion of an ideal state or the perfect temperature for your system. Sure. And then having technology, somewhat like a GPS actually, where you, you just, you've decided your final destination, and if you wander off a bit, no matter how you wander off, it will bring you back. It will recompute and bring you back to that ideal state. And you want that state to last for a certain amount of time. You may decide to change it. You may decide it's too hot one day or too cold one day. You need to adapt to the environment. But, but you can do that with a very simple control, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the automation will have all of these algorithms, smart algorithms behind. We are much closer than, uh, than you think. Probably we could have done this 10 years ago. But I think the, the mindset wasn't there. It wasn't ready. The world wasn't ready for that technology yet. Right. Uh, today, all of the, uh, the, the DevOps movement, the, the talk about um, integrating agile development with uh, system administration, automation, this is coming back in vogue. It's, uh, sure. I think the time is now. It does feel like we're on the precipice of accepting embedded systems. Right? Absolutely. Getting a little bit closer and any people who have the creepiness factor are starting to move away from that. Then. You know, everybody's got these smartphones, right. these tablets, these pads. It'll be in our clothing, that, you know, watches. The jump is not that far, right? I think so. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really You're welcome. Appreciate it.